Welcome back to Talk the Walk with me, Sarah Wong. I'm with Labor and Welfare Secretary, Mr. Luo Chi Guang, to talk about labor and welfare in Hong Kong. Now, let, let's switch gear to talk about the labor market. And before we delve into the situation of today's labor force, I want to um, shed light on the recent upboard that has been occurring in this lockdown public housing blocks. And some residents have been complaining about the lack of or the loss of compensation because um, they're essentially you know, locked down and they're shedding money while in compliance with the government's zero COVID policy. Shouldn't people's compliance be rewarded or at least compensated in this regard? Well, uh, we have to think about all the possibilities and reactions in terms of whenever we consider any uh, government actions. Uh, the discussion related to compensation or subsidy from the government had been with us for a very long time. And particularly during this epidemic, it was over two years. Uh, been, we've been discussing this issue over and over again and we consider and reconsider again the pros and cons and the downside of doing something. Uh, the key in the, uh, uh, I would say in the past two years, the key consideration is how to keep our ep epidemic down. Uh, our, our what we call the zero infection aim is that's what we want to. But any actions that will at the end of the day may compromise this particular goal is something we try to avoid. And the problem is uh, the prediction of human behavior in terms of whenever there is a kind of a government subsidy coming in. Uh, although I would say the great majority of people will be, will be compliant and they will be good citizens, but they're always a minority in our society. And that will blow up the whole thing. Can you tell us more about how human behavior under uh, the pretense of government subsidy could jeopardize the government's COVID response? Oh yes, uh, uh, if you probably recall almost like two, almost like two years now, uh, when we start to provide a subsidy for those who are infected and they have to stay in the hospitals and, and because they are not entitled to sick leave because of their occupation, their employment status, the government will provide subsidy instead. For example, they are on, on part-time work, they would not be eligible for uh, any form of uh, a sick leave. Then the government will provide such a subsidy. Then you hear it in the social media and people are actually promoting that will, they will be selling salivas that are infected. So you get infected and you get the government subsidy. You, you really don't know how true that is. In, 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 and, and actually people are actually thinking that this is possible to happen. And if that actually happened, that would compromise the whole effort in trying to keep the epidemic down. And furthermore, uh, related to the questions of quarantine. Well, personally, I would say we, we, we have all the heart to feel that we, we should help those who are affected by quarantine orders. But then the problem is if it is purely a scientific thing to tell which one should be quarantined then it will not be a problem for us to consider. But then the difficulty is because we have to rely very much on the persons who are confirmed, infected, and telling us who are their close contacts. And then the close contact will be, will be entitled to a certain kind of subsidy. It's very difficult to imagine how that will compromise the whole operation and can overwhelm the system. And it's very difficult. Well, I, I really, really hope that our society are people who are very really law-abiding. Uh, they, in fact, they are just making use of the system and not, ab not, not abusing the system. But unfortunately, uh, this is not the case. Uh, to me, it seems just like a question, a dilemma of incentive. So, for example, if you, if we can, you can actually provide some subsidy, some help to those who are forced to stay home, but that subsidy was not enough to incentivize those who actually do not have, you know, close contact with, with patients or do not have uh, the symptoms to stay home. Wouldn't that be a quite a nice balance to strike? Well, if it is too mean, the administration costs and actually overwhelm the whole, whole, whole thing. Uh, we consider many different levels of uh, subsidy in the consideration of all possibilities. 
And uh, when the level of subsidy is so low, it will not be politically acceptable for the public, mm -hmm. while at the same time, it will be very administratively expensive. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really worth doing something which I cannot consider to be generous enough, and yet not will invite uh, possible misuse or abuses. Uh, in, in, in remember, in the situation of a restricted, uh, what we call uh, a restriction testing notice, whereby people can only stay in a, a place and they can't, can't live it. But for some reasons, people have to enter, they can't leave. But once you enter, you're entitled to a benefit. You expect what kind of behavior you're inviting. And that is a very difficult thing to strike the balance. Okay, well, let's move on to the larger situation of the labor market. We know that there's some good news there. The unemployment rate in Hong Kong has been on steady decline from a 7% high recorded in late 2020. Now, um, but it appeared that the job market right now is mostly propped up by specific sectors such as construction and accommodation. Um, I was just wondering, is there a, any signs of an uneven recovery that's worthy of concern? For example, the predicament of the tourism sector, for example. Well, well definitely the uh, economic recovery is not even in the, in the economy. Uh, in fact, uh, back in 2021, uh, you were saying that the recovery is basically driven by the uh, increase in import and export. And then it uh, tripled down to different sectors of the community. And also there are also, because we have uh, increased our public spending, particularly in the like construction, development, etc., cetera, and, and, and so forth. So the economic recovery has not been even. And you can say there are ups and downs too, in particular industry like the uh, food and uh, beverage industry uh, and, 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 and so forth. So, so, uh, so the most important, again, uh, back to basic, is to keep our epidemic under control. You mentioned public spending. Um, we know that the economic circumstances in Hong Kong right now that include paying costs by the tightening social distancing rules, and then there's pressure of inflation on necessities and, and uh, utility prices. Now, what can Hong Konger expect in the upcoming budget on welfare spending, especially under these um, painful economic conditions? Uh, I'm definitely not in the position of telling anything in advance before our finance secretary uh, no, no, make his course. speech. Uh, I would say in, in the future, uh, social welfare spending will be keep on rising, at least in the long run. I'm not talking about the next year, and so I'm not supposed to, Just to tell. Just long-term trend. Uh, because uh, the aging population and the increase uh, in our public expectation to a better provided uh, provision of services, and that you expect. Uh, social welfare spending will be increased. And right now, in the current financial year, uh, the spending of social welfare is already number one within the government among all the different policy areas. It used to be number three or even number four, depends on which year you're talking about. Uh, now it surpassed the uh, health and then it surpassed the education spending and become the number one spending in the government recurrent expenditure. So you expect that to continue uh, in the years to come. Uh, you talk about uh, the long-term trend. I know you cannot comment on the upcoming budget, but you talk about the long-term trend on public spending. And how would you categorize your approach in balancing perhaps social and public expenditure with economic growth and fiscal responsibility? Well, definitely within the government, we have to consider all this uh, uh, holistically. Um, but then for for a Secretary of Labor and Welfare, and definitely we have our own role in terms of uh, achieving the policy objectives that we are aiming at. And therefore, from time to time, from year to year, we will have to, to compete for the limited resource within the government so that we can achieve our policy objectives. So that is the role of the Labor and Welfare Bureau. Now, on that note, when we're talking about the government and, and your role, um, as Labor and Welfare Secretary. Now, one of the criticisms of you seems to be um, against your personal mannerism. 
right? Um, and including a weekly blog post that some people say are quite technical and data heavy, and some people say that encapsulated your uh, sort of your elitist mindset in you know approaching policy communication. Um, is that an impression that you t intend to give, and why do you prefer that as a form of communication to with the public on uh, policy of your bureau? The weekly blog serves a slightly different purpose, and that purpose is trying to uh, explain to the public in a in a manner that way they will try that they will be able to better understand the logic and the reasons and all the pros and cons and uh, considerations that have been taken in, uh, into the whole process of policy making. So the, the purpose of the blog is really trying to, to make it a kind of documentation that is not as serious as a Legislative Council paper, uh, something shorter in length and uh, with less detail. Although you said there are a lot of data, yes, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, a thousand to thousand words in Chinese, uh, it is far less than what a paper uh, in the Legislative Council would contain. It seems like recently the government has been giving out a vibe of um, one rule for them and another one for another one for us, and that's of course following the incident where um, some senior officials attended a birthday party. This happened in a senior level of the government. Do you think that's acceptable behavior? Well, I, I can't uh, speak uh, on behalf of others. I can only uh, speak for myself. Uh, and uh, I would rather not to comment on my colleagues' behavior. But I would say for me, uh, I uh, always will consider uh, I do what uh, I can do best. Uh, I'm, my, my, the kind of work that I do best is actually uh, making policy analysis, uh, working with uh, departments and uh, cross departments or even cross bureaus in trying to um, make up uh, workable solutions uh, to meet the public demands. And so I spend more time on my time on doing this kind of work rather than uh, uh, doing kind of social connections and, and that kind of activity. That's not my my. My, my strength. You are part of this government, they're part of this government, and your work could be compromised by their behavior. For example, you, you just talked to me earlier saying that there's a very delicate balance to strike in uh, giving out subsidies to lockdown residents and so on. But on the other hand, your, your colleagues are attending birthday party that could also derail the SAR's pandemic response. So, it's kind of you know concerning your work as well, don't you think? Well, definitely, every action within the government and uh, every actions of uh, principal officers within the government, uh, we are also interrelated. And uh, but uh, I would rather reserve my comments on behaviors of others. Looking past, um, looking on the past four years, what would be you know the biggest challenge and the biggest regret? It is a very difficult question because uh, in the past four, four and a half year, uh, I'm trying all my efforts to try to deal with some of the, those uh, issues, policy issues particularly, that have been for us for almost decades. And that that locks and in the past. And I guess being uh, the Secretary of Labor and Welfare and the strings that I have in terms of policies, my best efforts is trying to solve these conf this differences so that we, I can unlock all these deadlocks for a lot of policy areas. Uh, I can say some of those deadlocks are unlocked, but not all of them. And uh, it takes a lot of efforts of trying to work out something that is acceptable to different parties. And at the same time, it is political both policy-wise or politically feasible. And also because most public policy will have an implication for public finance too. So somehow it, how to steer the process, to strike the balance, to, to, to make something happen is what I have been trying in the past four and a half years. Uh, I would say that there are some achievements, but definitely not to the satisfaction of the community as a whole. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your time today for speaking with us. Talk to what will be back next Saturday on HKIBC.